The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the Alzheimer's Live Chat. My name is Lakeland Hogan, and I'm the gerontologist and caregiver advocate with Home Instead Senior Care. I want to thank you again so much for taking time out of your day to join us for the live chat. We have a very interesting topic of practical dementia care techniques. And our live chats are brought to you by Home Instead Senior Care, a network of locally owned franchise offices. Home Instead Senior Care's network offers in-home care with an individualized approach to helping you keep your older adult loved ones safe and independent at home. And to learn more, you can visit homeinstead.com. And before we get started, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. So first and foremost, we have muted all of your lines, and we do that to reduce background noise and to allow you to go about your daily routine. So if you need to do dishes or uh, take a phone call, uh, the dog barks, don't worry, we can't hear you on our end. Uh, so the lines are muted uh, just, again, to ease that background noise. And then at any time, please feel free to type in your questions. There should be a question box right on your screen on the right-hand side. Uh, so there's no such thing as a silly question, so you can type them in now, or as we go along, if you uh, think of a question, please feel free to type it in, and then we will get to them, as many of them as we can here in the hour that we're given. And again, uh, that that question box is right there on your screen, the right-hand side, so type them in at any time. And then finally, no need to take notes because we are recording today's webinar or live chat webinar, and we will post it uh, to our Help for Alzheimer's Families Dot com page. We'll also send it out to you via email. So that way, if you uh, really enjoyed the chat, wanted to share it with a family member or friend, or go back and listen to a part that you really liked, uh, or maybe a part that you missed, um, don't worry. We have it recording for you, and uh, we'll have that back out to everyone very shortly. And that really covers all of our uh, housekeeping items for today. So we'll go ahead and jump into the topic. So we know that the day-to-day -day activities uh, that are involved in caring for someone that's living with Alzheimer's and related dementias can sometimes be overwhelming and exhausting. But there are some practical techniques for dementia caregiving, and we're going to talk about them today. We're going to dis discuss a variety of best practices, uh, some of them including minimizing symptoms associated with dementia, maybe uh, repetition, agitation, delusions, social withdrawals. We're also going to talk about some of the emotional aspects of the caregiving role um, and how these practical techniques and best practices can help caregivers uh, in their caregiving journey, hopefully helping to reduce some of the stress and emotions that come along with it. And we're really fortunate today to have an expert on the topic of dementia care techniques, Molly Carpenter. She is the author of Confidence to Care, a resource for family caregivers providing Alzheimer's disease or other dementia care at home. She's also a speaker, trainer, and a family caregiver. In her current role, she works with a team responsible for ensuring that Home Instead Senior Care's network of over 60,000 caregivers worldwide have the resources necessary to effectively provide quality care in the home and understand the importance of their work enhancing the lives of those they serve. And Molly is also working towards uh, gerontology education at the University of Nebraska Omaha, so has lots of great knowledge uh, from that part of her career as well. So welcome, Molly. We're so excited to have you with us today. Thank Thanks for taking time to join our live chat. Thank you, Lakeland, for your introduction and for having me. And thank all of you who are out there online, um, willing to participate, participate and be um, on this chat and, and ask some questions because I guarantee your question, somebody else has the same question out there. So thank you for your participation as well. Yeah, you, you bring up a good point. If you're thinking of a question out there, there's likely another caregiver that has the same question. So please do not be shy. You can type in your questions at any time. I see we already have some good questions rolling in. Um, so Molly, if it's okay with you, I'm going to just jump right in and ask the first yes. question. Are you ready? I'm ready. Sounds All right. Good. Well, we have uh, an individual, Tracy. She wrote in and asked, what are the signs of early dementia? So she must have somebody in her life that she might suspect has uh, dementia, wondering what are the early signs that we all should be on the lookout for? That is a great question, Tracy. Thank you for asking that question because I do think 
when people start to get forgetful or things are changing a little bit with memory, everybody starts to kind of worry, what is this something to be worried about? Or is this just, I'm having a day where I'm real busy or, or not thinking clearly. So I always go um, everyone to the Alzheimer's Association and look at, they have a great um, uh, 10 signs of Alzheimer's disease that are very conclusive or, or, very, or very give a really good idea of what people could be looking for. So memory loss that disrupts daily life. So this may be forgetting important dates or asking for the same information again or, or things that somebody's used to handling or taking care of, maybe asking about those activities that they normally wouldn't ask about. The second sign is about challenges in problem solving or in planning. So maybe I always go to tracking bills or tracking um, something monthly that maybe occurs on a regular basis, you know, um, coordinating different things, doctor's appointments, household tasks, those kind of things. If those become to be a problem or things start to slip, that could be an indication that there is some something you know, changing a little bit differently in the memory. Uh, another task, or, or number three, would be the difficulty in completing familiar tasks at home. So I, I think about, um, I had a family caregiver one time tell me that the, the, her and her husband played cards every night after dinner for an hour or so. And where she started to notice some changes was her husband kind of forgot the rules of the card game they were playing. Or he would do something that was not within the rules and pretend that, oh no, that's the rules. So that's where she kind of got suspicious because this was one of those things that they did almost every night of their um, adult life. Uh, a fourth sign, confusion with time and place. This is, um, this is one of those one of those situations where maybe they've lost track of the days or the season or the time of the day, or maybe they forgot where they are and how they got there. That's probably one of the big signs that, that is pretty apparent right off the bat that there is something to be concerned about. And then another sign or the fifth sign is trouble understanding visual images. Basically, um, this I look at this as judging distances or if you're walking with somebody and they step over something like a crack in the sidewalk that really doesn't need to be stepped over, but it's just, it's something visually different in the sidewalk. So, so a person may step over it or actually, um, you know, not being able to see from on the sides. So maybe not understanding like if when the sidewalk turns to grass and kind of slipping that way, there's just some um, visual imaging that can change in the eyesight. Um, number six is problems with words in speaking or writing. I think about this as um, probably the most common example even that the Alzheimer's Association uses is when you have a typical object like a pen and you call it an apple or something different like that. So again, different when you're trying to, it's, it's basically the person is trying to find the word to describe the object but they can't think of the right word so they just say a different word. Number seven is misplacing things or losing the ability to retrace steps. Number eight is decreased or poor judgment. Uh, this is, uh, again, kind of goes back to the, the, the sign about being able to track bills. This is where this can become a concern. So if, if things are looking different in the checking account, if there's a telemarketer calling and wanting money or wanting, you know, that this is where this can, decreased in poor judgment, this is a, is a concern. Unfortunately, this is a concern for seniors in general, so that's, that's difficult. Um, but it, and, and again, when you think about these 10 signs, it's, it's do they have one or more of these or a couple of these? That's when um, you need to get an evaluation done. And then the ninth one is withdrawal from work or social activities, and the 10th one is changes in mood and personality. So I know, I know that um, I invite you all to kind of look at those signs a little bit deeper on the Alzheimer's Association website. And if you are concerned about a family, care, a, a family member having 
um, any of these signs, I would definitely read a little bit more about it, but then I would talk to um, your physician or a doctor about it. There are some very simple cognitive testing that can be done that it can at least give you a baseline of where things are at and really start to understand if there is a cause for concern. Lakeland, what do you have to add? Is there is there anything I missed, do you think, there? No, I think that you you covered a lot of the early signs. And I think that you make a great point. Um, you know, if family members are starting to see, you know, a um, couple of these signs over time and or maybe a couple more um, over time that kind of develop, um, those are definitely some signs that you should get your loved one to uh, someone who could evaluate them. We actually had somebody just write in and ask how early, or uh, pardon me, uh, what's the best, how, let me start over. <laughs> how early should a family member be tested for dementia if uh, if their parent has the disease? So I know you talked a little bit about yeah. going in for an evaluation. So I guess I'm going to kind of throw in a, a little piece to this question. You know, where should they go? Is a general practitioner good? Do they have to see a specialist? Where should they start? And then, you know, if it runs in their family, how soon should somebody be tested? I know that there's a lot of buzz around uh, brain health and uh, getting your brain checked just as often as you get your heart and your lungs checked. Um, so mm -hmm. any thoughts on um, yeah. on this question? Uh, Ship wrote in and, and asked, um, S. Ship yeah. wrote in and asked that. So thanks so much for that question. Sure. Yes, um, I think that's a great question. And here's one of the, the interesting things that's happened in the last couple of years is Medicare has actually started to include cognitive testing in your annual wellness exam that Medicare requires every year for people that are on Medicare. So whatever year you go on Medicare, that would be the year for sure to start getting some of this testing done. And, and when I say testing, I know that might sound a little scary. It's not really testing. It's, it's about 20 to 30 questions, if that. Just sort of understanding, and that's what I mean, they, they get a baseline. And then every year they'll probably ask you a similar questions or a similar test to kind of track it as you age. Now, if you're not on Medicare yet and you're concerned about it or you've had a parent or a loved one um, have the disease, you can absolutely go sooner than, than, than Medicare age. Um, I think, Lakeland, you bring up a great point. Can you go to your family doctor or do you need to see a specialist? And I would say this. I would say that I'm a big believer in a specialist when it comes to aging issues. And those, you've got to think of it as they're, it's just like a cardiologist who studies the heart, a geriatrician studies seniors and older people and aging issues. So when you need, when you're aging, it, it, it is beneficial to see a specialist. However, I do think that with the changes in Medicare, where they're now covering this cognitive assessment, a lot more of our general practitioners and a lot more of our, do our family doctors do are learning about this cognitive screening. They're learning about the options of the cognitive screen and learning how to, to do those screens. So I think it would probably be a question um, and, and I've had family members directly ask their doctor. My own parents have asked their doctor, because actually because I told them to, or I said, I think this would be a good <laughs> idea. And I said, uh, why don't you ask your doctor if he's willing or is, is able to or has started testing his patients for cognitive impairment? That's all. That's a simple question. And of course, their doctor had. So they started their baseline testing, and then every year when they go on their wellness exam, they get that testing done again. So I do think it's a question if your doctor says, no, I don't do cognitive impairment testing or I haven't done those assessments yet, then that might um, be reason to find a different kind of or a specialist in this kind of a case. Thanks, Molly. I, I like that you got, you're getting your parents started on that. Um, I think it's, you know, it's never too early to have your, your cognition assessed, no. especially if you have concerns about it running in your family or you have relatives that have had um, this disease and you've seen what it's done to them, so you want to prepare yourself. So, uh, again, thanks for writing in that question. Um, we have another one that um, Sharon wrote in. Um, she um, is kind of along the lines of 
the, the signs and what to look for in dementia. She says, I feel like I'm always waiting for something to happen. Each day I watch and listen for something, but I don't know what I'm expecting. Is this typical? And she also writes that she's so sad because she feels like she's slowly lo losing her best friend. It's a very uh, lonely feeling for her. So uh, this kind of touches on the emotions of, of caregiving and um, you know, once somebody has a diagnosis, what should people be looking for? Um, it sounds like Sharon is, uh, you know, watching, waiting for something to happen. Uh, but y you and I both know that, you know, this is a progressive disease over time. So can you speak a little bit uh, to Sharon's question there, Molly? Yes. And Sharon, let me just start by saying, um, oh, it's heartbreaking to hear that you're sad and losing your best friend and how lonely this can be. I, I just wanna first commend you to thank you for caring for your loved one. And I know this is a hard journey and I, I try to empathize with you tremendously. Um, and I also wanna say, Sharon, you have really recognizing your emotions right away in, 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 this, you know, in this situation. I think that's a lot of times so, you know, and when we think about both of these questions or both of these comments that Sharon made, I think that a lot of you out there listening today, I think that it's so important to understand and recognize when, how you're feeling and why you're feeling that way. And I think that when you think about why, when we're waiting for something to happen, as Lakeland said, this is a progressive disease. So you're, you're probably correct in thinking that things are gonna change along the way. I think one of the things that caregivers need to, to consider is really um, where their mindset is at as you're, as you're a caregiver. And I know that's, I think it's harder than, than I make it sound to just, oh, think about things. But when you think about, I'm waiting for something to happen, Sharon, you might be feeling a lot of anxiety and I think all of you caregivers out there, you're probably daily feeling anxiety when if you're, especially if you're in the mindset of sort of like this waiting for something to go wrong, which believe me, I, we all have that in our lives. And, and so again, I appreciate that you're, um, you're in tune to it, Sharon. I guess I think that I would, I would recommend sort of rethinking about your mindset and rethinking about instead of waiting for something to happen, you're expecting something to happen, which is, is very good to have expectations in check, but also really concentrate on living in the moment. So when you have these good moments with your loved one and the day is going well, just enjoy it and live it and be grateful and sort of try to think about just being present instead of always in the back of your mind, what's happening, what's going to happen next. Cause it's, cause even though you think you might not be showing that, your loved one might feel your anxiety as well. Same with when I think about sadness and feeling lonely. Again, our, our loved ones, when we're caring for them, they, they feel what we feel. And I, they feel what we feel more than typically, typical than other people would because they are relying on that sort of feeling rather than words because they may not understand words, but feelings are feelings. Um, and I think, Sharon, if you're feeling sad and lonely and already, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to stay connected to a support system. If you've got your friends or you've got a neighbor or you've got your family or you've even consider a support group, like through the Alzheimer's Association or your church or one of those things, one of those areas, another support group, uh, we have a Facebook page called Remember for Alzheimer's. This group is literally one of my most favorite groups that I've ever been a part of on Facebook. This group is a community of caregivers that talk on a regular basis. They might throw out a question to each other and then you'll be amazed by the number of responses. So even staying connected um, that way is tremendously important. I think, I know Lakeland will agree with me on this and Lakeland and I tell caregivers all the time, like this is our number one message we tell caregivers is that you've got to care for yourself and I know this is hard to hear but you probably should be putting yourself first you have to do that not only to be a good caregiver but to keep living your life and living a good quality life but it's very hard for caregivers to hear that because 
you're always thinking of the other person and you're always putting them first. So if I can just reemphasize again, it's, it's important to recognize emotions, but it's also important to then um, find solutions or find your support group, especially when you're losing a, a best friend. I mean, I think about, I, I haven't, I haven't lost a, a loved one um, that was my best friend, knock on wood, so far in my life. But I, I'm picturing it like right now, if I lost my best friend, what would that feel like? And I, I, I'm feeling sad just talking about it. So I just think, again, recognizing what you're feeling and then finding an, a support from another venue because it's so important to sort of avoid that isolation and to stay connected. Thank you, Molly. I I agree. The caregivers, we always uh, have to remind this group that uh, we're speaking to to be kind to themselves because they're doing the best that they can and they are experiencing all these emotions and they do have to be taking care of themselves so that they can continue to provide the care that their loved one needs. So thank you for that. And you did mention our Facebook group and, you know, when we post this live chat, um, we had an individual, Jeff, he wrote uh, in talking about his wife and he uh, is having trouble getting her to bathe and to change her depends, uh, to change her um, her clothing, that sort of thing, and the Facebook group went wild with suggestions. So if you haven't already gone to the Remember for, uh, Remember for Alzheimer's Facebook page, which we'll have the link to here at the end of the webinar, um, you should check it out. There's lots of great tips and advice, and that could be uh, one of those support systems uh, that you put in place. But uh, Molly, you, that, that part about creating a support system um, is so important, uh, whether it's family, friends, um, you know, professional caregiving, your, your faith-based community, that can really make a big difference uh, along the way. So thank you, Molly, for sharing that. Uh, and we did have another question, um, kind of shifting a little bit more to some of the symptoms of dementia. Mary wrote in and said, what is the best way to handle separation anxiety? She said, if I tell my mom that I'm leaving for a while, she gets panicky. Or if I don't tell her, the caregiver might have a difficult time with her anxiety after I leave, and then I have to uh, leave my appointment or drop what I'm doing because of this issue. So she said she is thankful for any suggestions that we might have. So uh, Molly, any suggestions for Mary and uh, how she can um, better handle her mom's separation anxiety? Yes, Mary, I think this is a great question, and I think a lot of caregivers are coping with this on a daily basis as well. Um, I think that I would start by making sure that she's very calm and relaxed before you leave. Again, I go back to, I think you make sure, Mary, you're feeling calm and relaxed before you leave. Because if you leave anxious, she again is gonna feel that anxiety and that may, may, may be making her feel the same way. So I, I, it also goes with if you have support in the home, any additional caregivers or any other family members, this is a message to share with everybody. Um, but I also want you to think, Mary, a little bit creatively about what to say when you leave. Now, I know this is a chat, so I don't know a whole lot about your details and your living situation. So it's, it's hard for me to sort of give a suggestion, but I guess what I'm thinking is, um, was, are there times when she expects you to be gone? Or is there times that, like, have you had a, appointments that have been, you know, ongoing and set on a regular basis for most of your life? So, for example, a lot of times people have, like, a weekly or every other week hair appointment. So is that something she's used to you going to and and being a part of, or, you know, so, so I guess one of the th biggest things about this disease is like, how do you help keep a normal routine that your mom is used to? That's really, really important. So think creatively about some of those appointments, or um, maybe is there um, a certain time of day, if I can, you know, give another suggestion is maybe, is there a time of day where she's napping? that you can go for an appointment? Or what if you could get her into something she loves, for example, a puzzle or a TV show or um, sorting different 
coupons or cutting coupons or, or doing some sort of an activity that she loves to do that she's used to doing and can do, is there a way to sort of get her started into an activity before you leave? So all you're doing is saying, I'll see you in a little while or see you in a little bit, and she's distracted doing an activity or a routine that she loves to do. So I, I think um, I'd be, I would be very choosy about the words you use. I would make it very simple. I would even say, I, I'll be right back. I mean, I think in, when somebody has Alzheimer's disease or dementia, this, you know, it, I'm not suggesting that we lie or that we trick anybody, but we don't always have to give the amount of details that we're used to giving to other people, for example. So maybe shortening the kind of information. And again, um, making sure you, because Mary, you're probably very nervous to leave her too. I mean, I would imagine. Um, it is nerve wracking when you're leaving to go to an appointment and you just don't know how the person's going to react while you're gone. So you may be feeling a little nervous and that may be, um, she may be feeling that as well. Lakeland, what else? Is there other suggestions that you've, you've had that I might have left off? No, I think that you, well, you bring up a lot of great suggestions, you know, using, um, uh, Mira, you could use your mom's past, like, Molly had mentioned um, engaging her in activity that she really enjoys um, before you leave. So get the uh, if you have somebody coming in to provide respite, maybe it's a family member that's coming over to stay with your mom while you go out to your appointments or a home care company. Um, if you can use those activities that she enjoys and engage her in that with uh, the person that's uh, taking your place while you get some needed respite and some time away, then that can hopefully help to ease her anxiety. Uh, and then any tips that you can share with the person um, that is relieving you, that providing that respite of things that keep her calm. Maybe she has a favorite blanket. Um, maybe, uh, like Molly mentioned, a favorite TV show. Um, again, just trying to get her mind off the fact that you're gone. Give that person some tips um, on what she enjoys so that while you're away that person could can use those tips um, to help maybe redirect her to um, those activities so that they don't have to pick up the phone and call you and ask you to come back so yeah Molly, i think that you made some great points and um we hope mary lakeland, that that helps you yeah go ahead yeah and lakeland that that's a great point to say whoever is relieving you while you're going your appointments setting them up for success and making sure they know some of those tips but, but that's a great point. Um, and, and just, you know, so that they understand there are things. And, and, and it's okay to even, the, whoever is, is, is in there while you're out to say, um, yes, yes, your daughter Mary's gone, but she'll be back soon. Um, tell me about uh, Mary's childhood or tell me about your favorite memory of your daughter or what is she, what's she like tell me about you know even just sort of redirecting the conversation and getting used to, to kind of redirecting conversations to avoid the anxiety and the fixation on where's my daughter and and then kind of you, you know it's kind of where you start a conversation and then you when you say well tell me about Mary's childhood well tell me about your other children and tell me about where you lived when you were younger when you had your young family? Did you always live in this house? And so you can kind of like help people, especially the, the people that are subbing in when you're at appointments, be set up for success. That's a great point, Lakeland. Yeah, I like all those suggestions, Molly. Well, we have questions flooding in, so I'm oh. gonna get us moving on to uh, another question. We've had several people write in about bathing. Um, a lot of Liz wrote in and I talked about how her father no longer wants to shower. So is there a best way um, that Liz can get her father into a routine? Any tips uh, for best practices for bathing? Yes. Um, it's a question we get, Lakeland, as you know, I'm sure you get this one a lot too. We get this question quite often about bathing. And um, kind of what I go through, I just have a couple of, of techniques that I, that I have family members um, have told me work and I've tried and have, has worked as well. So number one is, first of all, again, I talked about routines, is kind of trying to match the routine that the person is used to so, and matching the method. So don't start showering somebody that's used to bathing 
and vice versa. Now, if, if bathing doesn't work because of um, physical abilities, then, then, then there's a different conversation and, and there might be a suggestion where we get a, um, a chair, one of those shower chairs for the shower. So they're at least sitting and then um, there's some different modifications we can make there. So I think that that's number one, trying to match the time of day they used to do it, how often they used to do it, and the mode is, is key number one. Um, I think that <clears throat> um, one of the things that I've, that I've used very often in my career, as well as I've, I was reading the Facebook page earlier today, a lot of people talk about music. And when they talk about music, it's a way to distract actually what's happening. So it's more of a, um, you put on music even 10 minutes before you're even thinking about approaching the topic and really getting a person into a, a good place with some familiar music or, or um, even songs they used to love to sing. And then you sort of start the process for um, discussing taking a shower or a bath, whichever way you go. I think another tip that I hear a lot is um, when you're talking to your loved one about this, you kind of give a simple choice. Do you want to bathe now or after breakfast? It's not when do you want to bathe or let's go bathe or let's, it's, you know, people with Alzheimer's disease answering yes and no questions are usually pretty safe yes and no question or pretty safe questions to ask. Um, I also think that you may have to consider modifying the task. And we kind of talked about that. If you've got a person who's used to, to bathing and now you are, are needing to shower, kind of going the sponge bath route almost with a shower chair with maybe one of those, a different kind of sprayer that's um, not coming from the top down, but a sprayer, the, uh, like a handheld hose that you can use and using sponges and, and you know, those kinds of things rather than, I th what I've seen in, in my experience is it's when the shower water from the top hits their head and it's, it's, they're just not used to it and why is this water falling on me and what does this mean? That kind of feeling. So any way you can modify that kind of um, with a with some kind of a hose might be helpful. Um, I also think, let's see, I'm trying to think of some of my other examples that I've used quite a few times. I have. I will say, okay. I, I'll oh, I have a thought, Molly. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Yeah. Um, one thing that we uh, do recommend on occasion is, is, I know I talked about we don't want to trick anybody and we don't want to, you know, necessarily lie, but but what experts in the field, they call therapeutic fibbing is the, is the term that people use. And so using a scenario that the person would understand that the importance of showering. So I, I have a couple of examples. One um, is where we've had, we've, we've had a caregiver um, had to say to the, to, to, uh, a senior that their daughter's coming over and they're going to go see the a play. Now they actually were going to go see a play, so that this isn't really a therapeutic fib, but that's what it took to get this person to get up and say, "Oh, I'm going. I'm going to go get in the shower." Now they don't say that every single time. They might just say, "Your daughter's coming over. Who knows what fun activity you might do?" Or it's such a nice day out. Maybe we should go. Um, do this fun activity and then so but we got to get in the shower first so they so again not saying they're not going to go do a fun activity or do something it's just a matter of finding the way to get them to real recognize my favorite story of all time is a um a caregiver who um it was a male caregiver and a male senior and um he was a former um, he was in the army, the, the senior was. And so the caregiver said, listen, uh, I forget the, I don't, I know, I don't think I ever knew the, the guy's name, the, the senior's name, but um, said, hey, general's coming in for an inspection in an hour. So we better get in the shower now. And this gentleman popped up and went right in that shower and had no problems. <laughs> and this was a very difficult situation. So there are some ways to, to, to do that, to, to think about using 
some of those therapeutic fibbing on occasion, if it, if it is, you know, with this gentleman, it had been quite a few days and it was absolutely vital that this person got in the shower and we all know the importance of that. Lakeland, what was your tip? Yeah, well, I was gonna mention, um, we, uh, Holman said has this uh, daily companion app for your smartphone that you can download. So caregivers, this is a great resource that puts tips and tools right at your fingertips. So as you were chatting, Molly, I just pulled up the app and typed in bathing and all of these tips and resources came up. And one um, that I like to tell caregivers when when it comes to any type of personal care is to make sure that you as the caregiver are ready before you take them into the bathroom yes. or before you get yes. them dressed. So make sure that all the soap is out, the towels out, um, everything is ready to go. If you're going to dress them, have all the clothes laid out so you're not having to, okay, put the shirt on, now run over to the dresser, get the socks. Or once you get them into the bathroom, take off all their clothing. Well, now I have to get all the soaps out. That person's going to get agitated uh, if they're or there's going to be a more opportunity for them to get agitated if there's a little lag time. But if you can keep that activity going smoothly because you're already prepared for it, maybe you have some of that therapeutic music, maybe you have um, some of their favorite smelling bath soap going, something like that. Yeah. It's going to make the environment more enjoyable, the activity more enjoyable. Um, but again, that app will have uh, it on, on the resources page. You can you can download it. It's free to any smartphone, and and you can type in any. Uh, sort of struggle that you're having, but I just happened to type in bathing. And in addition to Molly's tips, there are some great tips that pop up. So make sure to check out that app if you haven't already. Well, thank you so much, Molly, for talking about bathing. I, we get so many questions on these live chats about that. Um, and and we've been talking a little bit about you know agitation, and we know that that is definitely a symptom. Um, that we see very commonly in, in individuals that are living with Alzheimer's and dementia. And Lisa wrote in and, uh, um, about her situation. She said, what's the best way to handle agitation? Um, she says, such as a loved one saying that they need to pack their things and go home when they're already home, or they get angry that they can't drive the car when, they're no, when they no longer have their license. So uh, we, these are some very typical scenarios, I know, Molly, that you and I see out in the field um, yeah. where agitation, frustration comes along. And I know for you know, a lot of people, they're losing their independence to this disease. Uh, so it can be very frustrating. Um, and they're forgetting um, that the home that they live in is their home to them, maybe their home, um, at this point in the disease is their childhood home. So they don't think that they're home. So that might cause some agitation and that re repetitive questioning. So any tips for Lisa on how she can help her loved one with these sort of uh, maybe anger and agitation issues? Yes, and, and Lakeland, you brought up a good point and I'll go right from your point. Um, Lisa, a lot of times the, the person it has some sort of an unmet need. And Lakeland mentioned frustration and, and maybe not understanding where they're at and not understanding whose house this really is if it doesn't look familiar to them. And so what I often recommend caregivers to do is to sort of think about um, a person's unmet needs. So a lot of times when we see symptoms like anxiety or anger, those are a sign of, of the person is upset. There's a need not being met that they have at that moment. They just don't know how to verbalize it to us. So instead of him saying, I don't know where I am, I don't know what house this is, there he's going to start packing and, and, and just do an act do something does to help him feel get this feeling under control. So I so I always, I look at it with, with four different areas to focus on. And the first is sort of emotionally. Are they sad? Are they bored? Is he frustrated with the situation? Does he understand? Is he stressed? You know, just kind of thinking emotionally what could be happening right now in this moment. Second of all, is socially, is everything okay? Are they, are they feeling lonely? Are they feeling, are they isolated? Have they not, has, has he not seen his friends in a while and he's used to seeing friends or used to have coffee every morning with a friend and now doesn't have coffee as much with the friends? Um, again, not being able to verbalize, that can be a social need that, that is very, that can, you know, cause the person some anxiety. And then physically, if, is there anything happening? So are they hot or cold? Is there, 
Um, too much clutter? Is there, are they in pain? Are they hungry? Are they thirsty? Um, and then finally, environmentally, what's happening? So again, this could go back to, is it a different living situation? Is something not familiar? Or is it um, noisy? Is it crowded? Is some, has the furniture been rearranged? Is the lighting poor? I mean, I could go on with lots of different examples, but I, I think a lot of times when these when these things are occurring, it's because there's some sort of an unmet need. So if you can kind of step back and think about it from those four perspectives or, or any other perspective you can think of and sort of try to figure out what is it? What is it? it does he need to use the restroom? Is, does he, does it does, um, here's a common one. Um, whatever his daily routine is, you've hit a time during the day where he was typically doing something else. So he's feeling anxiety like, geez, you know, I usually, you know, do some, I usually um, have, have already taken a walk by this time and, and I don't think I've walked today. And so then all kinds of anxiety happens and I got to go, I got to pack because I got to go and go on my walk or whatever it is. So I feel like caregivers out there, if you can kind of start to think about what could have caused the, the behavioral symptom, which in this case is anxiety and frustration, and then try to look for ways to minimize that in the future by um, meeting whatever need that is. And that might be, guys, that could be a very well, you might be asking them lots of things like, Dad, are you thirsty right now? Are you hungry? Or, or let me get you a sweater, you know, whatever it could be. Um, it's going to take a little bit of trial and error. But I do think I have a lot of caregivers, and I know I'm going to say this word journal, I'm not talking about, well, it's very helpful to journal your feelings and to, I re definitely recommend that, but what, there's some people keep a journal just of what's kind of happening during the day to sort of understand what are the periods that I need to be concerned about that a symptom may appear and or what's happening at those times when I do, when he does start packing, what led up to it? What, is it the time of day? Is it the weather? Is it, is it cloudy outside? Is it, you know, there's all kinds of things to think about. So even a week long journal, and it's a quick, quick little journal of what happened, how I fixed it or how I minimized the symptom and then what was happening in the background so I know what to do next time kind of a thing. So I hope that that's helpful in thinking about these, some of these symptoms. Yeah, it's almost as if these, as caregivers, we all have to put on our detective hats and try yes. to get to the root of of what's causing that behavioral symptom. Because and that's one of the things I love about your book, Molly, your Confidence to Care book, is you talk about all the unmet needs that might be occurring and how to identify those those needs. And I know as we approach the holidays, you mentioned, is the room too noisy and too crowded? I know that that's always a kind of a uh, popular time of year when um, caregivers are thinking, you know, oh my goodness, can I get my loved one to a family gathering? Well, those, if you kind of go through that unmet needs checklist, if you do take them to that gathering, maybe it's the, maybe there's too many people in the room, it's too noisy. Um, maybe if you're out holiday shopping, all the stimulation might be a little too much for the loved one. So, uh, or maybe it's in a lot of uh, parts of the country, it's getting cold right now. So maybe yeah. it's the change in the weather, the seasons you mentioned. Uh, the body temperature. Maybe we just need to put an, automatically put a sweater on first thing in the morning until yes. instead of uh, waiting until they uh, express some sort of agitation, and then you think, oh yeah, maybe they're cold. Uh, so, like you mentioned, that journal it can be such a powerful tool um, for caregivers, and especially if there's multiple people that are helping to provide care, because yes. it can also serve as that communication tool too uh, between caregivers. Um, as they try things. And we know that uh, the saying out in the field is, if you've seen one person with dementia, you've seen one person. It's because the disease affects everyone a little bit differently and what sometimes may work for one individual might not work uh, tomorrow, but it could work the next day. And so that can be a source of frustration for caregivers, but um, it's so important to uh, not be afraid to fail as a caregiver uh, because you'll likely learn something from that and then not and don't be afraid to try that again later because it might just work a few days down the road or even a couple hours later um, but that's just kind of the nature of this disease and unfortunately our loved ones can't control um, how it affects them um, and so hopefully like 
Molly, you provided some great resources and tips and uh, tools, uh, and hopefully Lisa finds them helpful as well. So thank you, Molly. Um, and that, Lakeland, yeah, that's anything great. else add? Yeah, you made some great points as well. And I think, um, Lisa, one more thing I would just add to is that Lakeland made me think about was um, it's okay to empathize and to say to your loved one, I know this is hard. I'm sorry. I, I don't, I can't imagine what you're going through or, you know, we're in this together. It, it, it's okay sometimes to say those words it's it's one of those well you don't want them to, you don't want to remind them they have alzheimer's or you don't want to bring it up or you don't want to you know bring light to it but it it is okay to even if you just said dad i know you're frustrated and i know you're um trying to pack to go somewhere but let's get through this together help me you know tell me where you're going or you know just even i've seen a lot of caregivers sort of change that that whole um i'm going to sit down and and like you know, try to understand and tell them I understand. And I've had people be successful with that technique. Now it doesn't always work because they might just say, I got to go, I got to go and, you know, still be agitated. But if you're calm and asking calmly and, and, you know, I'm so sorry, this is hard. I, I wish I could help you. I don't know where to, I don't know where you're going or, you know, even admitting that I'm sorry if I did something wrong, even when you kind of take the blame or apologize for something, even if you didn't do anything, which I'm sure in this case, Lisa, you didn't, but um, you even just apologizing kind of diffuses it like, oh, so she must be like, she's apologizing for something and I don't, you know, it just kind of relieves the pressure of the moment sort of a thing. So I just think about that as well, kind of reassuring empathizing, I know this is hard, kind of using some of those phrases. I've seen family caregivers have success with that as well. That's a great point there, Molly. And um, and I just had somebody write in and ask um, the name of that app that we were talking about. So I just wanted to plug that again, just so uh, um, this individual was able to get the name of it. It's called the Daily Companion app. And you can go to helpforalzheimersfamilies.com. Um, and there is, uh, a tab that says resources. There's a lot of resources on there and we might as well just go to our resource slide while I'm talking about this. We do have time for maybe one, two more questions, but that help that first website, helpforalzheimersfamilies.com. On that site, you can um, find the app. You can also uh, find Molly's book, but you can also find it on confidencetocare.com. And we've been talking a lot about that Facebook group, uh, Remember for Alzheimer's Families. So that's listed on here as well. Um, and Molly's also brought up the Alzheimer's Association, uh, the ALZ.org. That's where you can find some of those resources like the support groups and the 10 signs of uh, 10 early warning signs of, of dementia. Uh, so we've been talking about a lot of great resources. So I wanted to make sure that everybody um, got a chance to look at that slide while we take a few more questions. Um, so we've had um, some questions come in in regards to activities. Um, you know, a few people have mentioned that their loved one no longer engages in um, activities or they're having difficulty finding activities that uh, they will engage with for an extended period of time. So Molly, uh, I know in your book you talk about activities and you have a lot of experience in that um, part of the caregiving journey. So would you mind sharing some tips and resources on how family caregivers can engage their loved one in activities? I would say maybe, can we talk about it um, in maybe the, the mid to late and late stage too, because I know, especially in late stage, families sometimes get frustrated because their loved one, like you mentioned, might not be able to verbally engage much anymore, um, but they still want um, to interact with them. So would you mind offering up some tips sure. and, uh, on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, uh, first of all, I would have to say that I think when people think about activities, typically what I hear people think of is arts and crafts and, you know, baking bread and doing those kind of things. And those are great, great things. But what activities really are, are about engaging your loved one in meaningful um, instances throughout the day, activities, whatever you want to call them. And so when I say meaningful, they, that means they have to be a little bit personalized and individualized. So the great news about being a family caregiver is you probably have a very good indication of, of the person's likes and dislikes, 
their routines, what they used to love to do, what their hobbies were, what they're passionate about. And so I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves as caregivers. I've seen this where we're trying to have them do these wonderful um, activities that maybe um, they've never even done before. Like I've seen people think, well, painting's therapeutic, so I'm going to have my loved one paint. Well, they, if they've never painted or touched a paintbrush, yeah, they may, they, it could work, but in the, it may not work because they have no idea what a paintbrush is or what it's for and what, it, what their painting might look like. So I would very much encourage you to really understand the person's you know, life story and, and life journey and what they've been through. So um, let me give you one story from my past um, caregiving life where I had a lovely lady named Teresa who um, every day at like four o'clock got very, very agitated and we could not figure out why. And, and everybody out there, I'm talking months, we could not figure out why. And we thought it was some, like the, the sunlight changes. I don't know. We, we, but we kind of did exactly what I'm telling you to do is sort of it is, is, talked to her she had a husband who did not live with her though he lived in a in a different facility and we, you know we'd ask George every day what George what does Teresa like to do we have to find her an activity to do she's so miserable at, from four to five you know we just don't know what it is so after many conversations and months of trying many different things like painting for example I will tell you I've tried that uh, <laughs> she looked at the paintbrush and said I don't know what this is so uh, there you go. It's fail failure all the time. But um, finally realized, you know, Teresa was a housewife. She had bo she had sons and she had her husband who owned a paint store, George, and he would come home every day at five o'clock, like 515 on the dot. He would close the store at five, be home at 515 and dinner was expected at the table. So do you know what we realized? At four o'clock, she was in her regular life, in her routine before Alzheimer's disease, before she was 82, she said she used to be preparing dinner starting at four because she wanted to set the table. She always had fresh flowers on the table. She got the water glasses out. This was a woman back in the day. Remember, they had jello salad as an appetizer. They had a dessert. They had fresh rolls. You name it, this was her. So it dawned on us one day, why don't we invite her down to the community, we li this was in a community that she lived in, and have her help us start setting up for the dinner hour. And let me tell you, we changed Teresa's life and our lives as well, because from that moment on, she was helping in the kitchen, she was filling water glasses, she was folding napkins, she was setting the table, she was getting the salt and pepper shakers out. And for that hour, there was no more agitation, there was no more tears, there was no more frustration. And that, guys, I wouldn't say, is that an activity that I want to do? No. I mean, I'll, I do it. But it's not, it's not like this fun painting or arts and crafts. It's a meaningful activity in her life that she was missing. And every day at that time wanted to be doing that. She wanted to be doing her housework. And that's what she did. So when I talk about meaningful activities, you good thing about being a family caregiver is you probably know a lot of these things. So I invite you to sort of think about it from that stage. And, and as somebody progresses to the mid to late stages, there are still opportunities. Music is always an opportunity, even when somebody can't verbalize anymore. Um, if reading the paper, reading a book that they loved out loud to them or getting a talking book, um, uh, even soothing things, sensory things like, um, Low, like doing a very a nice hand massage with lotion. I mean, there's all kinds of um, sensory activities that you can do as well that that may not be. Um, it, it just it's just to soothe or to make them feel better, and to sort of keep them connected to you as a caregiver and to another person. Kind of that social or that connectedness need that we all have. Molly, I love those examples, that, that example that you gave. I've uh, worked with a variety of clients that, um, just like you said, we had to do some investigative work, talk to the families, and ask, you know, 
what did they used to do for a career? One gentleman was a banker. Uh, and so we got a giant jug of money and put it in front of him and he sorted the pennies from the quarters, from the dimes. Um, and it was something he was familiar with. He, it was an activity and he, to him, that was a meaningful activity. Um, yes. You know, so it can be very simple. And even, um, you know, while these individuals are losing their ability to do so many things, they can still participate in their daily routine and those things you can consider as activities, you know, helping to fold the laundry, helping to make dinner, um, even if it's something as simple as stirring or, like you mentioned, setting the table. Um, you know, we had another, I, uh, I had another story where a gentleman used to um, be a trucker and his caregiver found YouTube videos online where this gentleman just talked about different kinds of trucks and he loved it. They put it on at a time when he became really agitated, um, and because that was something that he, I mean, he used to drive a truck almost every day of his life, um, and now um, he was able to engage um, in an activity that was meaningful to him. He got to, you know, even though it was a video, look at somebody describing trucks, those things that he worked on every day of his life. So it can be very simple, and caregivers don't have to run out to the local craft store and buy up everything. Um, there's th things in the home that people can use to make yes. meaningful activities. So, Molly, yes, I, think that, I think that's a great point. Yeah, yeah, and I think, Lakeland, sometimes we put so much pressure on ourselves um, to have this you know, have the person contributing the way they used to contribute, but the but to the person with Alzheimer's disease or dementia, contributing is the factor we need to worry about and feeling relevant and connected. So even if it is as simple as counting coins, to us, that may seem like that isn't very relevant or he's not really contributing to the world, but by God, somebody had to count those coins and now we know how much money is there and we're gonna take it to the bank and get a, the cash for it or whatever we're gonna do with it. But my point is, is we have to kind of retool our expectations about what, what the point or the goal is. And the goal is simple as relevancy, connectedness, and contributing to society or contributing to the family or contributing to their loved one, back, contributing back to you caregiver in some sort of way. So don't over, you know, think about it from such a big place because that's how I used to think that. I used to do the same thing. I was a, a, I'm actually a rec therapist, a recreational therapist, and I actually thought that way for many years. And I, and, and turns out it's just about having them see, stay relevant and contribute to society in whatever way that shape or form. So really kind of take that message to heart of meaningful activity is different to everybody. And knowing, being a family caregiver, you've got the tools and the knowledge to, to make those meaningful activities occur every day. Absolutely. And I know we're almost out of time, but we, um, we've had a couple questions rolling in, you know, sometimes caregivers feel overwhelmed in their caregiving situation. They might feel a sense of guilt on thinking, you know, I might need to hire an outside help or move my loved one to a facility. Um, we had Norma write in and she said, my husband has dementia and I'm the sole caregiver. She says, I'm needing professional help and the situation is beyond me. Where can I go to find resources? So Molly, uh, I guess as a last kind of closing question for us, um, if family caregivers are feeling overwhelmed, where can they turn in terms of getting extra assistance? You know, Norma, that's a great question. And, and I applaud you for asking it because I think what a lot of caregivers do is they don't even, can't even admit they need to ask that question. So I applaud you for doing that. I think there's a variety of solutions available um, for families. It, you just have to find the right solution for you. So there are companies like Home and Sid Senior Care where a caregiver can be hired and brought into the home while you're uh, doing, re well, if you need some respite or running errands or going on vacation or whatever it might be, there are services like that um, that can help you. There's, there's also other support services and systems out there. I think a lot about um, your area agencies on aging and meal programs or a bath aid once a week. Um, there's some good resources on your area agency of aging websites as well that might might be helpful. Um, of course, asking your family, your additional family members or your neighbors or the person's friend, 
even if you just need a couple of hours to go run an errand or an hour every morning to go to the gym or your every other week hair appointment, whatever it might be, you can, it's okay. People are wanting to help and they're, they are willing to help. It's just, we have, when we have a specific job or task that we need them to do even better because they they're feeling helpless and they don't know what to do. So involving your community in different ways can be helpful as well. Um, Lakeland, anything else that I might have been forgetting here? That I guess I guess I feel overwhelmed by the question because there are quite a few resources that we can. You're right. And I think like some of the websites we've given you can also steer you into some of those different resources as well. But Lakeland, what else have I forgotten? No, I think you you brought up some great points. The Alzheimer's Association has lots of great resources. Uh, you had mentioned the local area agencies on aging, and that website where you can find the one closest to you is the letter N, the number four, the letter A dot org. N four A dot org. You can look up the the area agency on aging closest to you. So those are two uh, great resources. Um, and you know, asking around, uh, seeing who people in your community have used and had success with. Um, and also, you know, the internet is full of of a lot of reviews and information. But I think it's always important um, to to ask around and get first-hand accounts from people who maybe have used uh, the certain service before. So, but I think you brought up some some great resources um, for family for family caregivers. And I think another message is it's okay to ask for help. Um, you're not in this alone. Um, and uh, that's some, something that family caregivers need to remember. Um, and I, I want to really quickly, before I wrap up, remind you that we do have another live chat coming up on November 16th. Uh, we have expert David Troxel. Uh, he's going to be talking about relationship-centered dementia care. Uh, and David is a good friend of, of Molly and I in Home Insteads and uh, a great resource um, on all, all things relationship-centered dementia care. Um, so excited to have him. So mark your calendar for that. Um, and you can register already online for it at healthforalzheimersfamilies.com. And as a reminder, we'll send this recording out to you. So feel free to share it. Um, and if you have any questions, always feel free to email us at live chat at homeinstead.com. But Molly, I want to thank you so much for your time and for your great tools and resources, tips that you provided us. Um, We've had a great discussion. We had some questions we couldn't get to, or we apologize, um, but we hope you tune in with us next time. Um, and Molly, again, just thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening and be uh, have, a, have a good day. And we always remind our caregivers to be kind to yourself. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.